Hello, my name is Paul Stewart and I'm currently in the Japan Airlines First Class Lounge at Haneda Airport where I'm about to fly to New York in their Boeing 777. Now I'm really looking forward to this flight because while the seat is aging and doesn't have the bling of the Middle Eastern Airlines, I've heard a lot of really positive things about the service on board. So let's go and check it out. The first port of call was a dedicated check-in area to drop off my bag. I didn't have to wait at all and it was then through customs and security. Now in the distance you can see literally the longest queue known to human history so I was very appreciative of being able to skip that and join this much smaller queue. This isn't just for first class so if you hold status with any airline it's worth checking if you're allowed to use it next time you're flying through Haneda Airport. Next up was the First Class Secura Lounge, which begins with this fantastic looking corridor. I'll show you the food shortly, but I'll begin with the section down the end called the Red Suite, which is frankly quite awesome. It's like a private lounge, which anyone is able to visit and includes a champagne and psyche bar, games room, library, shoe shine, and heaps of very cool aviation related bits and bobs. A particular excitement was this Japan Airlines branded Boeing SST, which was a supersonic passenger airliner under development before being canned due to cost overruns. Unlike the rest of the lounge, which was quite crowded, this area remained fairly quiet and this allowed me to film the intro to this video. Next up, I was out into the common area to grab some food. There were chefs on hand to make a small amount of food to order, but otherwise everything was presented as a buffet. I must admit I was a little surprised by the lack of an a la carte menu, a bar and table service, as that's generally regarded as one of the differentiating factors between business and a first class lounge. Now having said that, the staff were walking around and were very happy to help. As it was around 8 in the morning, I sat down to eat breakfast with this JAL original rye galette which was made to order, and then some other bits and pieces. I also snuck in a coffee and of course a glass of fruit juice, all with this view of the airport apron. This was actually my aircraft arriving, a Boeing 777-300ER, which are the largest passenger aircraft in JAL's fleet and their main long-haul airliner. Next up, I was off for a massage in these new mechanical chairs, which was an interesting experience. As I was going to spend the next 13 hours stuck on a plane, my last part of the lounge experience was to check out the showers. Overall, the lounge was fine, although it can get pretty crowded, so a tip would be to trundle over to the One World Partner, Cathay Pacific Lounge, which is really impressive. It has a bar, dining area, and I'd argue more comfortable seats, so I sat back and enjoyed this really fantastic view of the airport. It was eventually time to head to the gate where the boarding was done with typical Japanese efficiency. I always try and get on board early to get some filming done and to quickly sneak in a few more drinks. There are two rows of first class in a one-to-one -one layout. Middle seats are perfect for couples and the window seats are perfect for single travellers. These suites have actually been in use for a number of years although they remain pretty comfortable. In front of you is a TV screen and below that is a decently sized table. There's also a ledge with a seat belt although I'm not sure if they're designed to dine with a fellow passenger or not as the TV screen didn't look particularly comfortable to lean back on. I'll look at this amenity kit later, and in the meantime, explore these cubby holes. There's a power plug in here, which I must admit only seemed to work intermittently, hence the delay in this video getting edited. And further along the ledge is the seat adjustment buttons. 
the in-flight entertainment handpiece and a mirror. Next to that is another enclosed storage space and something I really like is somewhere to store your glasses. I always forget to bring my glasses case and never really know where to put them when I sleep. Um, so this was really disproportionately exciting for me. Next up is our light. And a very wide and comfortable seat. You can store stuff under this ledge, including this little space for your shoes. Although unfortunately, there were no overhead air vents, which was unfortunate as I always like a steady stream of air and tend to find aircraft cabins a bit too hot. Obviously, it doesn't have doors, although it's still fairly private, as you can't really see your neighbours. Although, a warning to Game of Thrones fans, people can still see your TV screen. Now here's the Amanta kit in Fetching Pink and of course I'll be giving this away and a few other JAL goodies to a subscriber with details of that later in the video. Slippers were provided and a Bose noise cancelling headphones. A warm towel and a champagne was offered although surprisingly no top ups were offered which I thought was odd since I bought it around 30 minutes before the door was closed. Now I do like this leather folder though, which all the forms and menus came in. We pushed back and headed for the runway. You'll notice in the background the disappointed faces of several ANA 787s wishing they hadn't been ordered with Rolls Royce engines. Now I actually flew with them last year and my review of their business class is on my channel. Unfortunately, my view of the GE90 engines wasn't great, but they still made a fantastic sound, so I'll stop talking temporarily while we take off. While we climbed through a few layers of cloud, I got a great view of what I think was Narita Airport, which I flew into on the previous day. My review of Japan Airlines 787 business class product from Sydney to Narita is also on my channel. Once we leveled out, the lunch service began with the Salon 2007 Champagne, which in Australia sells for around six dollars $700 a bottle. Now for my international subscribers, that's about half of Great Britain's post no deal Brexit GDP and they're still no good at cricket. It was served with these nibbles, which I can't actually find on the menu, so you'll have to guess what they are. I can see some salmon, shrimp, and what appears to be a raisin. And for the foodies out there, I'll show you all of the menus at the end of the video. Next up was the amuse-bouche, which was tartar of pen shell, scallop, bamboo shoots, and white asparagus in bonito broth vinegar jelly. After that, was caviar which was served with this pearl spoon. Now I read on the internet somewhere that it's best to avoid using a metal spoon as it oxidizes the caviar or something like that, which is some fun trivia. Unfortunately, by this time they'd run out of the salon and there was no 2007 Comte de Champagne. So I had to change to the Louis Roderer Crystal 2009. By this time, I realized I wasn't actually dressed for dinner. So I took off to the bathroom. Now there are two bathrooms at the front for first class passengers and they're packed with the usual amenities. PJs are provided and with the help of some editing trickery, here is what they look like.
On returning to my seat, I discovered that the Comte de Champagne had actually been found, and I had a glass of that. Now, I really have to apologize, as I don't really know how I did this, but I seem to have missed filming the main course. Or maybe it wasn't served to me. As I did admit, I did feel a little peckish, hence why I ate a bit more shortly afterwards. Anyway, sorry about that. Now, dessert was next, and it was this fantastic tasting Kotoka Strawberry Milfui and a glass of Graham's Tawny Port. Following that, a towel was brought around and this skin care packet thing. The view out the window was stunning and spoiler alert, the sunrise I captured was honestly one of the most amazing in-flight views I've ever had so keep your eyes peeled for that and some soppy music. Wi-Fi internet is free for first class passengers although it was painfully slow so I didn't really use it. Here you can see it struggling to load Facebook's notifications so I gave up and watched some water falling. The sun was setting so I thought I'd check out this royal blue tea Queen of Blue which is essentially an exotic tea served in a wine bottle. Apparently the tea leaves are only picked at a specific time each year and it costs around 50 Australian dollars which for my international viewers would buy you a nifty penthouse in central Adelaide. It looks quite nice and tastes like tea. The view of the setting sun over the northern Pacific Ocean was pretty amazing although I was feeling a little peckish so I went for something from the a la carte menu. This Japanese hot udon noodles tasted perfectly fine and I got a top up of the royal blue tea. Next up was more dinner from the a la carte menu. First up was this tasty Fumiko Japanese set plate. Cubed tuna sashimi and avocado, green leafy vegetables and quinoa dressed with sesame uh, kelp soup and steamed rice. Following that was the western option. Uh, which was roast lamb with herb breadcrumbs and Japanese pepper paste with seasoned vegetables. And for dessert, a fromage blanc mousse with citrus fruit. This was all washed down with a nightcap of whiskey. My bed was made, well this is actually footage from the morning afterwards with better lighting, and there was a hard and soft mattress option. Of course, being the delicate petal and westerner that I am, I went for the soft option. It made for a really comfortable bed, although before I turned in, I got one last glimpse of the setting sun. I don't know about you, but international travel and flight is now so easy that we really take it for granted about how incredibly amazing it is that we're able to hurtle through the air in an aluminium can. Just a few generations ago, people would never travel more than 100 kilometers from where they were born, or a journey overseas would be done once in a lifetime and they'd never return home. We really are a fortunate generation. Views like this stunning sunrise over the northern United States really put things into perspective. And after my attempt at being deep and profound, make sure you check me out on Instagram and Facebook for more similar aviation views. And how good does the GE90 engine look by the way? It's amazing engineering. As we were only an hour or two out from JFK, I went for a light snack, which was the assorted cheese and coffee, which came with this timer so that I knew when it was time to take the plunge. I sat back and enjoyed more window views while checking out the in-flight entertainment which to be honest was reasonably average. The content was limited and the screen was from an era when 480p was considered a high definition. It's like a 10 year old car, look the engine and the seat can be perfectly fine but the technology will always be lacking. And unlike my ridiculous dog food analogy in my China Eastern First Class review two weeks ago, that actually kind of made sense. I just ended up streaming BBC World News. And lastly, they brought around this piece of chocolate in an incredibly complicated container. Unfortunately, due to some rather stormy weather in New York, I didn't get any views of Manhattan, so you'll have to put up with this cloud surfing, and then some disastrous autofocus failure on landing. So, how was the flight? Look, it was really good. The sea itself is certainly aging, but it's completely functional, and while it doesn't have doors, it's still very private. 
I didn't look at my neighbour and I don't think they were looking at me either. The service was pretty good and the crew promptly delivered and removed dishes. The call bell was answered very quickly and they were always very happy to help. The food and drink was also pretty good and apologies again for not recording the first main dish and I still have no idea what happened there because I'm usually pretty good with recording everything. Having said that, I did feel quite hungry halfway through the flight so there was a part of me that wonders if it even came out at all but anyway. The 777 is a good aircraft although it was really interesting comparing it to the 787 from the day previously and again on the flights back to Australia I flew in both aircraft. Now I do love the engine spool up, although it is noticeably louder in flight and the air is drier than the newer composite Dreamliners, but I can't complain, it's still a pretty nifty bird. And of course, there's the giveaway. There's an amenity kit as well as a few other JAL goodies and to enter in the competition simply comment below including JAL First Class in brackets and I'll randomly select a winner 30 days after the video is uploaded. Full details are below. If you enjoyed the video or found it helpful, please click the thumbs up button and check out my channel for many more similar reviews including Cathay, Qantas, Emirates, Qatar, BA, Malaysian and China Eastern First Class. Thanks for watching, safe travels and coming up are the menus after the autofocus failed to capture what I reckon would have actually been quite a cool display of the reverse thrust on a wet runway.